Well, hey, good evening, guys. Good to see you on a lovely Wednesday night. Sure getting darker earlier, isn't it? I was wearing my shades on the way here, and I'm going, I don't think this is going to work in a couple more weeks. I'm not going to be able to wear those things. So, so we're going to start in the book of Ephesians tonight. And most of you already know, we, we have a Thursday night group, and it's almost all virtual. And the gr- two groups are very diverse and very different. It's almost, it's not the same. And uh, so we're doing the same thing, and they're, they're like a week ahead of us. So I tell the groups, if you miss one day, do the other day, and you'll be caught up, and it'll be fine and everything. So, so we're going to do that. Tonight, what we're going to actually do is a survey of Ephesians. The one thing I like to do is when I do start a book is actually do an introduction, talk about the book itself, of the author, or those types of things. And, and then, again, do a little bit of survey where we actually look at the themes of the book. What are the primary points the author's trying to make? What's God trying to get across to us? And so that's what we're going to do tonight. The one thing I'll emphasize for this evening is it's going to be a lot of Scripture reading and a lot, not a lot of expository. About after every Scripture, I'm going to make it one line as to just what that particular theme or that Scripture means. But that's about it. We're going to just kind of go through it. I will try to set a land speed record and break Phil's record of most chapters in one evening. Tonight we do six, but uh, hopefully it won't feel like six. It'll just uh, fly by. And so if you do have your Bibles, go to the book of Ephesians, because we are going to be reading there, and I want you to be reading along with me. And let, you know, and it talks about uh, washing with the Word of God, right? And tonight, let, let's be washed. Let's be washed with the Word as, as we go through it. You read it, take it in, and, and just embrace it and let it flow right over you as we go through this. So when we <clears throat> actually started this a couple weeks ago in I actually did an introduction, and it was actually two weeks, and actually we went through the, uh, the book of Acts, uh, Acts 28, 22 through 28, because we wanted to have the experience of what, what Paul did from the point that he was arrested in Jerusalem to, the, to his journey all the way to where he was imprisoned in, in Rome. And, and there for those two years, he was basically under house arrest, but during that time, that's where he penned the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, the prison epistles. And, and this is the first of those. And so, and as we go through tonight, this won't, it's not just about the letter to the church of Ephesus, but it's also about the church of Ephesus. And I'll learn a little bit, little about, been about these guys also, so, so Ephesus, it was really was the most important city in, in Western Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, and it was a in, major intersection of trade routes. It, it was a hub of commerce and trade, and significant was the pagan temple dedicated to the Roman goddess Diana in Greek Artemis. And on Paul's second missionary journey, he visited Ephesus after leaving Corinth. And many believe he actually planted the church of Ephesus at this time. We find this in Acts 18. It actually may have been planted by Aquila and Priscilla, who were the church leaders in in the church of Ephesus. And even, and if you look at Acts 18, uh, they disciple Apollos, who became a church leader also. So Aquila and Priscilla actually uh, discipled Apollos in Ephesus. On Paul's third missionary journey, Paul spent two Two, three years teaching in Ephesus, Acts 19 is where you'll find this. And he spent his time dealing with false doctrines and pagan practices because you had the, uh, the Roman goddess Diana, that temple there, right? And then finally, Paul stops on a nearby island of uh, Miletus, I guess, or Miletus, I'll just say that. And he makes his farewell address to the Ephesian elders. And you'll find this in Acts 20. And what happens, this is really kind of a neat, cool, poignant scene, because as they're leaving and as Paul speaks, they all start weeping. They all start crying. And because they know, though maybe they don't know, this is the last time they'll ever see Paul. And as, they, and as this is taking place and they all pray, they're crying and praying together, and this is the last time that they'll see Paul. About a decade later, after the church had been started, uh, Paul wrote the letter to Ephesians. It was about 10 years later when he wrote the letter. 
And again, it was from Rome while he was in prison. And, and he commends them for their faith and love. And Ephesians seems to indicate that these guys were doing pretty good. They were doing all right, kind of like Calvary Chapel Foothills. I think we do pretty good here. I think there's a lot of love in this fellowship. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I always believe that we're doing the will of God and we got, and we got a pastor with the big heart, a worship, faithful worship team. I, I, I think God, God thinks we're doing okay, you know. And that was true for the church in Ephesus. And Paul didn't express when he wrote this, he, he didn't correct him. This is a letter with zero correction. There's no correction. Or so. so when you look at it, he, he, he commends them, he encourages them, and he gives them instruction in the Christian life, but there's no correction here. Paul speaks to their position in Christ, and if there's one significant theme to the letter of Ephesians, it is in Christ. And boy, we're not going to be stopping talking about that at all. If there's anything the believer needs to know is who they are in Christ. But then while at the same time, after he talks about who they are in Christ and all that God has done for him, he moves into what? Encourage them in regarding their position and how they're to behave as a believer. What does it mean? If God has done this for you, what is our response to him, right? And so during these early years, they've uh, been growing, they're expanding, they're doing really, really good. And Paul... Paul loved the church in Ephesus. Armando loves the church in Calvary Chapel Foothills. You got to have a big heart, big heart, right? So it was probably during the reign of a Domitian, which is like 81 to 96 AD, that the apostle John was banished to Patmos. And it's this time, this period, that the Lord, not Paul, but that the Lord gives his assessment of the church in Ephesus. And through the Apostle John, we have Revelation 2, 1 through 7, where he compliments them on their works and their zeal and all that they do, but he admonishes them for leaving their first love. And so we don't really have any way of knowing uh, whether they corrected this or not. We, we don't have any visibility of whether they fix this thing, whether they return to their first love, Jesus Christ. We don't know that. But it is known that in later, later centuries, it, Ephesus did become a leading city for the councils of the early Roman church. And, and they believe that ultimately the church in Ephesus died sometime during the second century. And so like every, everything has a life cycle. You know, you're born and then you die. And that is also true of the church of Ephesus. It was born and then ultimately it died. So as we look at the survey of Ephesus, and it is a survey, we're gonna be at about the 100,000 foot level looking down at the whole of this book and looking at each particular chapter. And Ephesians is typically broken up into two parts, into two parts. The first three chapters speak to the position of the believer. Man, this is just righteous stuff. Understanding who we are in Christ and all that God has done for us. But then chapters 4 and 6 speak to the response or the responsibilities of the believer. After you know all of this and what God has done for you, it exacts an appropriate response. And that's what chapters 4 through 6. And, and I kind of like the way it's broken up like this because we should, in our teaching, in our teaching, we should get an appropriate amount of time to both of these things. Talking about what God has done for us and then talking about what we should be doing for him. That's, that, this is a good balance. We shouldn't teach obedience without teaching who we are in Christ. And we shouldn't teach who we are in Christ without obeying, right? And Ephesians does both of these, presenting the position of the believer and the response of the believer. So we're going to go through, and so be in chapter 1, and like I said, this is going to be a lot of scripture reading but the first thing I want to do, and you'll never keep up with me here, so don't try, is all the, all the scriptures, not all the scriptures, but most of the scriptures that have to do with being in Christ. And actually, uh, being in Christ or, or its equivalent appears about 35 times in Ephesians, where you're in Christ, right? To the saints who are in Ephesus, faithful in Christ Jesus. And blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is going from chapter 1, verse 1. And you'll be able to follow most of that because most of this is in chapter 1, verses 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 11, 13, and then in chapter 2, right? Blessed be the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, 
Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation world. Adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. He, God, made us accepted in the beloved. The beloved is Jesus. The beloved is Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also having believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have saved, raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. In Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In him, the whole building being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord. The Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. All of this in Christ and all of this for us, all of this for the believer. That's the position of the believer, being in Christ. And then we also find in these first three chapters our position of the believer, the work of the Trinity in regards to salvation. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And reading, reading uh, verses 3 and 4, chosen by the Father, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose him in us, in him, before the foundation of the world, chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, verse 7, in him, Jesus the Son, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, chosen by the Father and redeemed by the Son, and then sealed by the Spirit, verses 13 and 14. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory, sealed by the Spirit. So now you see the effectual work of the triune God and the work of salvation, that for the believer. We are chosen by the Father, we are redeemed by the Son, and we are sealed by His Spirit. Significant, significant theme in the book. And then something kind of interesting, Paul does something interesting. Now he gives us a prayer. Uh, go to Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 15 and 23. I'll be reading 17 through 19, but it's really kind of interesting. While he goes through all these things about who we are in Christ, then he stops, and, and it's called the prayer of Revelation, verses 17 through 19, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? See, Paul is praying that what? That he would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In other words, God really, 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 really wants you to know who you are in Christ and all these things, that you would understand these things, that they would be deep inside you. It is God's desire. It is Paul's prayer that you would do that, that we would know what are the riches of his glory and the inheritance of the saints. These are, as we will find out later, our spiritual blessings. And then the position of the believer in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read verse 1 and then 8 and 9. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses in sin. Once we were dead, now we are alive. Verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is interesting. 
when I think upon this verse, I can't think of any more important verse in all of Scripture, in all of Scripture, that we have been saved by grace through faith, not of what we've done, but this gift from God, right? Not of works. And that we're as workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do these very things. That would be the response of the believer. And then the position of the church, which is us too, but this is more corporately, Ephesians 2, 11 and, and chapter 3 to 4, 4, 13, reading chapter 2, verses of 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, who has broken down the middle wall of separation. Mondo Shara talked about this Sunday. Having abolished in his flesh enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting death the enmity. And who are the two? It's the Jew and it's the Gentile, and he has made us all one. There is one body in Christ now. And then in uh, chapter 3, verse 3, verses 6 and 7, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I become a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. And so this is one of the big mysteries, with it, mystery, biblical mysteries is what? that God has made salvation available to the Gentile. That would be you and me. We're the beneficiaries of this. And now, when God says, his people, remember what the angel said at the advent? He will save who? who? He will save his people, his people from their sins. Well, that's us now, too. So his people is taking on a whole new meaning, a whole new meaning. Well, that was a pretty quick three chapters, wasn't it? All right, three more. So now we're going to talk about the response of the believer. And this, by the way, this is always where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where it meets it. If, if, if God has done all these things, and I say, if all these things be true, if all those things are true, Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, verse 1 Paul speaking again, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And if all these things are true, our position, who we are in Christ, they require response for those that are His, to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And that means in every aspect of our lives. It should shape everything we do. It should shape everything we think. It should shape everything that proceeds from our mouths, if all these things be true. And, then, and he starts first in the response, first in the church, Ephesians 4, 4 through 16, reading uh, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, Jesus himself, and I believe John 17, prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. We are one in the body of Christ. That, that's our identity as believers, that we are together, we are one. And then verses 12 and 13 for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This equipping by the Spirit of God, expressed, by the way, by the spiritual gifts of God, are for His church, so that we, His people, would be very an expression of himself. We're literally expressing himself to all the other believers. And what happens with these gifts? What are they intended to do? They are intended to edify the body and build each other up. These gifts are not for us. They're not for you. They're not for me. They're for us to use to build up the rest of the body, whether it's here or up in the worship team, 
whether it's where the, where it's Patty in the sound booth, what, whatever God has called you to, ministry of helps us. We just had a, a ministry meeting where, where it was so amazing actually to see about 15 people in here wanting to serve God, including giving haircuts, and and that was about that was half our church, man. You know, our summer thing. I it, it almost brought me to tears, and I'm not kidding. I go, how cool is this? How cool is this? And that's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. And so in Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, it's off with the old and on with the new. That's why I call it off with the old and on with the new, verses 20 through 22. But you have not so learned, Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, according to your former contact, conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Paul said, he says, I, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, which is godlessness. That's what they walk in. And you know what? They don't know any better because their nature is a sinful nature. They have the old man, and that's all they got. They have the old man. Verses 23 and 24, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Put on the new man. What does that mean? It means to put on Jesus. That's what putting on the new man is. We're putting on Jesus. And he's the new man in us. That's that life. Before this, we were dead, and now we're alive. We have the new man. We are in Christ. And then continuing to respond, Paul says we are to walk in love and walk in light. Ephesians 5, 1 through 17, reading verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us, given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Man, you know what? When we were, what? What does it say? When we walk in love, it's an offering to God that is a sweet-smelling aroma to him. That's what our love, it, it blesses God when we do this. In verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So now we're called to walk in love and to walk in light. And now it comes down to living real life, that this gets expressed in all of our engagements in life, living life with love and submission, Ephesians 5, 18 through chapter 6 and 9, and verse 18 through uh, 21. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, the reality is, is no one who is intoxicated, and by the way, whether it's wine or alcohol or anything else for that matter, because there are plenty of things that intoxicate us. It can be a relationship. There are a lot of things that can intoxicate and ultimately do what? This is the thing. Intoxication is a self-choice. It's something we choose to do for ourselves in whatever form that may take. And it's not a God choice, and it's not a choice from others. It's, we make that decision when we choose to become intoxicated. And because of that, because of that, uh, the, that person has no capacity, has no capacity to actually submit or love. That person who chooses self, and any time we choose self, we do not have the capacity to submit or to love. Love, we can't love. I'm choosing me. How can I possibly love you? And, you know, it's, it's like submit. Um, you ever try to reason with a drunk? That ain't going to happen. 
There's no capacity to submit either. And if you look at the context of, of this actually verse, while that might be the leading sentence here, it actually moves into after, after that, worshiping. But actually the primary, the primary verse here, sentence, for all of this is what? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so the key thought here contextually is actually submitting to one another in the fear of God. And we'll see this work itself through in the rest of the verses. Because right after verses 18 through 21, verse 22 is, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. You know, by the way, this is, this is great, great instructions for husbands and wives, right? Say, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives. And it's not just love your wives, but love your wives is what? How Christ loved the church, right? How did Christ love the church? Died for the church, right? This is, this is an incredible thing. And, and if you've been in ministry long enough, you do marriage counseling, you do. I mean, you just people start. You know, relationships are hard sometimes, and so so when I counsel, I tell the husband, "You read everything it says about husbands, and don't you dare read anything it says about wives." And I tell the wife, "You read everything it says about wives, and don't read anything it says about husbands, because God wants to deal with us individually." <laughs> You know, I remember way back when, for me, in, in, in a struggle in a relationship, and I wanted God to fix something. You know, we always want God to fix something. And as I went through, and you know what? It didn't get fixed. It didn't get fixed. God just spoke to me so clear. He, you know, he Skip, yeah, you know, I wanted this too, but fixing, <laughs> fixing your heart was far more important than fixing this relationship. I want to fix your heart. And that, 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 that has sticked with, stuck with me the rest of my life. Verses 6, or chapter 6, uh, one, verse 1, it says, uh, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In other words, the submit in love doesn't stop with just the church, which we did at the beginning, and, or, or wives or husbands, but God applies it to children too. Kids. God has orders, instructions, commands for children. He does. Parents, parents, grandparents. We, we need to influence our children, our grandchildren this way. We really, really do. We need to give them the order of God because God has an order. And they're to submit to that too. You know, and I think all of us would agree we're probably in 2 Timothy 3, 2, and 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be a litany of things, but primarily this one, disobedient to parents, etc., and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I think we're there. I think we're there. And then it doesn't stop there because that was addressing like all of the family and everything, right? And then in, in verse, uh, uh, verse 5 or 6 5, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. And so uh, we're not slaves per se in the workplace, but we have somebody that's over us if you're in the workplace. Actually, it wasn't a Bob Dylan says you got to serve somebody, right? But, you know, you work for somebody. And what does it say to do? To be obedient. I got to tell you, one of the hardest things to do sometimes is submit to your boss. You, know, you don't like how he treats you. You don't like what he's saying. But God makes it real clear. You're to, you're to submit. We are, we are to be submitting. And this one, and you masters, verse 9, and you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality in him. This verse changed the way I operated as a manager. It changed me in regards to how I treated people that were to submit to me, but I was to what? As God is my master, I am to treat them accordingly. I am to treat them accordingly. That's what the gentle spirit. A little bit of change, completely changed the way I managed people. 
But this, when you look at this whole, whole thing, is, is it's a huge responsibility when you, we are in leadership, whether it's in home, whether it's in the workplace. By the way, whether it's at Calvary Chapel Foothills. Leadership has huge responsibility. But responsibility begins with love and submission. You will never, ever, really, truly, ever be able to lead until you learn how to submit. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. And God gives us the instruction, the instruction, the wisdom, and the power to exercise these responsibilities as unto him. Spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, 10 through 19, verses 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. And let there be no doubt we are in a spiritual battle. But he gives us, he gives us the weapons to overcome the evil one. And the weapons are himself. He gives us himself, whether it's the shield of faith, it's him. No matter what it might be, he gives us himself. He is the overcomer. He has overcome the world. And because he has overcome the world, we are now called overcomers. And then verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to the sin with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Because these spiritual battles are one on our knees in no other place. These, these things are one through prayer. In fact, he said, it only, sometimes, sometimes it only comes out with prayer and fasting, right? Prayer and fasting. And then finally, Paul concludes in Ephesians 6, 21 through 24, reading 23 and 24, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those, I like this, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, that we mean it, Right? Paul's being pretty clear about it. Grace to those who love Jesus sincerely. Grace to them. So he closes it with peace and love and grace. Okay, we just finished three months of Bible study. We just blew through six chapters and my head is spinning. But we're not done yet. Because you've got to close, right? You've got to have final thoughts. Because something can come up really cool and brilliant. But that what we're going to do. We're going to get real basic here. Here it is. Paul uses the verb agapao and the noun agape. It's love. He uses love 19 times in Ephesians, and he does this in more than any other letter or epistle that he wrote. Of everything he wrote, he said the word love more in Ephesians than any other book he wrote. And he starts in love, which, which we see in uh, chapter 1, verses 4 and 6. And then he finally ends in love, as we read in 6.23. He goes, peace to the brethren and love with faith. So m really, make, make no mistake about it. Ephesians is a love letter. It is a love letter. And Paul, without question, is building up and edifying the church in Ephesus. By the way, this is why we like Ephesians, right? Because we need to be built up. We want to be built up. This is really you know, Paul's expression of love for this church. But 20 years later, we can go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. This, this was written 20 years later. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these Things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars. And you have persevered and have patient and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Man, I don't want to ever hear that. I don't want to ever hear that. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, 
or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know, there's really only one verse that matters in all of that, and that is you have left your first love. It's the only thing that matters. This, this accusation, this admonishment. You know, they started off, you know, so, so much in love, right? And then, then something happened. You have left your first love. Remember, saints, that we are married to Christ. We are married to him. He, he, we are the bride and he is the bridegroom. And, and, and when you think about being in a love relationship, and I think about what, what Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, that's what we're talking about, the church, specifically to these guys, applicable to us, but specifically to them. He says, you have left your first love. But you know, you, there's almost like there's something missing there. You know, you don't add to scripture, but there's something missing. Because when you leave your first love, you leave that first love for someone another. That's what happens. When we leave our first love, it means we're loving something or something else, someone else, more, more than our first love. Because something has to be our first love. Something has to be. And if it's not Jesus, then it's going to be something else if it's not him. You know, most of us know that love wanes. We've, we've, we've been in relationships, we're married, and, and we know what it's like for that, that excitement the, where the sparks are flying, and it's the most wonderful time. And, you know, in those, those wacky times where you fall so deeply in love that you're walking into walls and stuff, right? And you're almost delirious and, um, like, drunk, intoxicated, right? Like we talked about earlier. And that love is there and everything, and, and it starts with great emotion, but, you know, that intensity is not sustainable. We know that. Nor is it intended to be. It does have its purpose, but it's not intended to be sustainable. What we hope is that over time, it becomes an intimate life partnership where you remain lovers, but you also become best friends. That's always the hope. And it doesn't always work out that way, but that, that's always kind of the hope. And we know that love, love wanes. It changes. It's not always the same. Thus it is with God and our relationship with him. Our love wanes. Our love wanes. But you know what? His love for us never changes. It just never changes, right? And though we are faithless, he remains faithful. God is the faithful lover. He's the faithful lover. And so how do we keep Jesus? How do we keep Jesus as our, as our first love? You know, they're the obvious things. And we always say, well, you need to be in a word. You need to pray more. That's our motto. <laughs> See if he's paying attention. <laughs> you need to worship. That's skip. <laughs> you need fellowship. We need it. We need all of these things. What to maintain our relationship with God? His word, He talks to us. Prayer, we're talking to Him. Worship, we're giving Him the praise He so richly deserved. And fellowship, we're one in Him. And this is where we see God through each other, and and we get that. But the one thing I know more than anything else. If, if I want to be close to somebody, to love somebody, I need to spend time with that person and preferably alone. Man, we need to abide in Christ, to maintain that first love. Abide in him. Abide in him. And so the church of Ephesus is a lesson for us, which is very obvious. They had great doctrine, right? They defended the faith, man. They had a zeal. They wanted... But they lacked one thing, right? Their love for God had waned. Our zeal for doctrine, our, our theology, doing all the right things, being dedicated, being right, does not equate to love for God. It does not. It does not. 
so I always, always remember this because I, I, this is foundational to maintaining our love relationship with Jesus so we do not wane like the church of Ephesus did. 1 John 4, 14 through 19. And we have seen and testify that God, that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed that the love of God, that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And here, here's, 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 here's right here. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because we, he first loved us. Our ability to love God is directly a function of us abiding in his love for us. You can't love God without his love. It is impossible. It is impossible. And when I finally kind of thought about wrapping this thing up, and there was one thing, just kind of one thing went, in, went, went into my head. And that's, that's this hymn called uh, More Love to Thee. Bruce Carroll does a great cover of, of this song. And the first verse goes like this. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Uh, hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. Let's pray. Father, help us to love you. Help us to be in that place where our love is not waning, where we're not waxing, but Father, we are abiding in you. And, and you're the one that keeps us there. We are your children. We are in you. And we know, we know. You want us to know. You want us all to know just how much you have for us. But not just that, that we would be expression of that in every aspect of our lives. That as you tell us who we are in you, you also say, now that, that this is true, this is true, respond accordingly. Help us to do that. And again, we just thank you that you have poured out your love upon us, that you loved us first. So we are in a position to love you right back. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. In Jesus' name, amen.
Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Put cross before. turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back no turning back Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you. And everything I need, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. God bless you guys. Fellowship, love on one another. Hang out well, with us. Well, so announcements. So we got, oh, uh, yeah. got the, if you want to get a week ahead virtually tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Friday women's study still going? Yeah. You got a Friday women's study? Wednesday, Wednesday. Uh, right? Wednesday uh, study too? For Spanish. if you speak Spanish. All right, okay. All right. And then, of course, Sunday. So uh, when does Greg get back? Are you missing him yet? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, hey, that's all, folks. <laughs>